Yes, good idea. Uh, one more side. So the other one of the S in April 2024. So there is a superfusion flavor, six for TCM of the incisor, and also the nasogastric tube inserted for feeding and nutrition optimization due to the drop of the tumor. So the NHP showed the moderately differentiated animal carcinoma with A1 positive. So the other PET scan uh, in April is low. So there is a hypermetabolic uptake at the lower isopathic mass. And also there's a small volume of uh, non aggregate uh, in the uh, intra abdominal nodes and also the nervous standing nodes. So we underwent CT thorax, abdominal, and pelvis. There is no distance uh, metathesis. To only the irregular eccentric circumstances depending on the distal esophagus that shows suspicious of esophagus pregnancy. So, MDT discussion for then uh, in between brain surgery, radiology, and oncology team. So, at that time, the aim is for the anthic laparoscopy. Since the CT scan shows no evidence of metastasis, however, we know that the gastric cancer usually came in late state. So, we do the anthic laparoscopy. So in terms of finding, there is a multiple spread of the tumor from nasal to nature of stomach and in to to placida and also multiple intra-abdominal nodules. So we took out all the nodules and also we sent the peritoneal fluid for uh, cytology. So uh, it turned out that the intra-abdominal uh, nodule negative for malignancy. However, the peritoneal fluid cytology showed a metastatic adenocarcinoma. Okay, so this patient uh, was referred to oncology for initiation of chemotherapy. At that time, our intent is palliative, but this is where we uh, want to talk about the conversion therapy. So the, this patient already, uh, received a four shock for six cycle and completed in July. So internal CT scan that has done chemotherapy after the fourth cycle. So, actually, not much changes. Uh, and then we repeat the OGTS in July and so, but the tumor has shrunk. And so, uh, we can see that the tumor has become smaller. Between three things. So, basically, clinically, patient improving with less symptoms. And so, uh, the consensus is to complete the chemotherapy for six cycles and aim for surgical resection after completion of chemotherapy with curative intent. So this patient underwent operation, laparoscopic converted open, total gastrectomy, D2 lymph anatomy, low NY reconstruction in August 2024 after completion of uh, chemotherapy, six cycles. So in triops, no ascites, no intraperitone nodules, liver no nodules, uh, Apparently, uh, the bowel is normal. There is a thicken and integrated area at the cardiac esophageal junction. So, no obvious extension into adjacent structure or pleura. So, on table endoscopic showed no tumor. So, we decided to convert to open property addressment and uh, it turned out that no tumor property. So, this is in trial finding. So, uh, when we lay out the, uh, our gastric specimen, there is no uh, macroscopically seen the any tumor. So this specimen had sent to pathology. So the HPE uh, showed that no residual malignancy seen that uh, even uh, the uh, impression that this patient has pathology complete response. No, no. So in view of that, I would like to invite the production from pathology team uh, to discuss about the pathology scene.
sort of back-to-back -back pattern, almost like a creepy form uh, pattern uh, lined by these malignant cells that uh, have vesicular nuclei, prominent nucleoli and a little bit of eosinophilic cytoplasm. And uh, just to share as well, this um, usually more often than not, we get uh, gastroesophageal biopsies that have uh, Barrett esophagus. Which is uh, uh which is which can predispose to dysplasia and malignancy. So what we see is uh, the intestinal metaplasia with uh, the presence of uh, goblet cells, which usually you see in the intestine. All right. So uh, on the twenty sixth of April, we received the uh, peritoneal fluid uh, uh, taken pre chemotherapy for this patient. And uh, the fluid uh, were from a few areas. Um, the lesser sac uh, sh showed to be a uh, presence of atypical cells. The visceral surface of the liver also showed atypical cells. A right upper quadrant, uh, suspicious for malignancy. And the Paris Plinic, uh, we were able to conclude as metastas metastatic adenocarcinoma. So um, this is the um, smear from the Paris Plinic fluid, which shows these clusters of uh, malignant cells exhibiting hyperchromatic nuclei, and you can see irregular uh, nuclear outline and high NC ratio. Okay, and on the 29th of April, we received, uh, as Dr. Najah mentioned just now, um, the splenic nodule, peritoneal nodule, and the liver nodule. Um, all these nodules were mainly fibrous tissue and uh, they were negative for malignancy. So this is the splenic nodule, this is the peritoneal nodule, and this is the liver nodule. Okay, and uh, at the same time, we also received the uh, esophageal biopsy um, uh, mentioned as 5cm proximal to the tumor margin. <clears throat> so this is consistent with uh, reflux esophagitis. As you can see, these are fragments of... Uh, um, uh, esophageal tissue um, lined by stratified squamous epithelium and you can see the basal hyperplasia, basal cell hyperplasia over here and um, occasional intraepithelial lymphocytes and some congested vessels as well. Uh, no dysplasia, there's uh, no Barrett and uh, no evidence of malignancy. <clears throat> and then uh, excision post chemotherapy we received on 21st of August. Um, this is a gastrectomy specimen uh, that we received. And uh, as Dr. Naja mentioned, um, our cross examination, we did not see any tumor grossly. And uh, we entirely submitted the cardioesophageal junction for microscopic examination, as well as multiple sections from the other parts of the stomach. Okay, so um, we noticed there's uh, areas of glandular atrophy, and over here things clearer. Uh, glandular atrophy actually in the long run can predispose to dysplasia and malignancy. And the other parts of the stomach uh, were pretty much normal actually. This is the GOG, this is the stomach. Okay, so we concluded as uh, there's no residual malignancy, which is a pathologic complete response, uh, modified Ryan score zero, and all the lymph nodes were negative, the margins were free, and there was foci of glandular atrophy. Thank you. That's all from me. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Lakshmi, uh, for the uh, presentation on the pathology perspective. So, uh, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Kairia from uh, Oncology Team, to give a speech on the conversion therapy. Uh, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, and very good morning everyone. I'm Kairia from uh, Department of Radiotherapy Oncology. Okay, today uh, our topic is basically GOJ, uh, management of GOJ uh, adenocarcinoma uh, with conversion surgery. So just a little bit of recap. So this is 70-year-old gentleman with multiple comorbid, DM hypertension, IHD and Dancoros previously and diagnosed with GOJ adenocarcinoma with positive intraperitoneal cytology. Uh, he, he had the diagnostic laparoscopy in April uh, this year and that noted there is a contiguous uh, spread of tumour from less curvature of stomach and his sisera. Splenic surface, multiple small nodules over surface, nodules seen invasive from and visceral surface of liver and he also has a minimal ascites, a small peritoneal nodule over right upper uh, condom and HPE confirmed is from uh, the liver, uh, the spleen and peritoneal nodule was negative or malignancy. However, from the ascites, uh, fluid was uh, positive. So basically, uh, management in uh, managing a cancer patient is very, very complex. So there is no right uh, treatment for everyone. So we need to determine what is the aim for uh, aim of treatment for this patient, whether it's a curative, whether it's a palliative. Okay, so in this case, this patient has uh, localized treatment, uh, lo localized disease, but there is a evidence disease in the ascitic fluid. So we conclude that this patient actually has a chance for conversion surgery. Okay, so the aim is basically um, curative in a way that we want to give a try, give it, give it a chance to patient, give systemic treatment, and then we see how it goes, repeat the scan, repeat the, the scope and all that, then we decide from there. So basically from for oncology, there are many uh, guidelines uh, that we, we basically uh, you know refer to. So for systemic treatment, usually we refer to uh, ESMO and uh, oncology. So for, so sorry, it's a bit busy slide here. So for Georgia cancer, we usually divide it to two, squamous and adenocarcinoma. Okay, so for adenocarcinoma or Georgia cancer, usually we treat like uh, gastric cancer. So the standard of care is systemic treatment. So usually we give systemic treatment, chemotherapy, and then we assess. Usually we, uh, uh, we followed by surgery and then another round of chemotherapy after that. So, yeah. right. So, how do we uh, uh, manage locally advanced uh, and uh, potentially resectable uh, disease? So, in this case, usually surgery is still the backbone of the uh, of curative intent treatment for for both histology subtype for squamous and adenocarcinoma, and pre and pre uh, pre and uh, perioperative treatment using chemotherapy or chemo radiation has been shown to increase rate of resection with no tumour at the margin of r naught and survival rates in esophageal cancer. However, there's a caveat in T2 and n naught. So in this case, for T2 and n naught, sometimes we need to you know, um, uh, decide further whether we can do upfront surgery or uh, you know, um, initiate with systemic treatment. So there's a lot of discussion in MDTs. So there are a few uh, strategy for pre-operative uh, pre strategy. So you can give either chemo radiations or chemotherapy. Okay. So there are trials. So I hope I don't bore you with a lot of trials. So oncology love trial, love statistics. Okay. So for chemo radiation therapy, uh, we follow the cross trial. This is a quite uh, old study back in two thousand four through two thousand eight. So there are three hundred more than three hundred patients, one to one. Um, 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 patients, uh, we give either uh, five weekly cycle of carbopecli with uh, radiation therapy, so it's about 20, 23 fractions, okay, and then followed by surgery. So, towards the end, usually we do the imaging, uh, we refer back to the we refer back to the surgeon to the scope, and if the surgeon feel that this is uh, resectable, then uh, followed by surgery, and then we give another round of radiation to complete. And in this study, we include the T1, N1 to T2, T, T2 to T3 uh, disease. Yeah? And we include both a squamous cell and adenocyte of the uh, esophagus and a GOG um, tumor. Sorry. So uh, both uh, histology is uh, quite quite equal um, um, at both uh, arm uh, for new adjuvant chemotherapy and surgery alone. 
and there's a quite a lot of number for uh, distal esophageal and GOJ uh, tumor. So as you can see here, compared to surgery alone, neoadjuvant chemo radiation had better survival rate. Okay. And as you can see here, those the, the patient with squamous cell has better. The means meaning that the the, the 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 effect of the survival is more pronounced in squamous. So usually for squamous cell uh, esophageal, we are pushing more towards chemo radiation than chemotherapy alone. Okay. Right. How about pre-operative uh, chemotherapy? So pre-operative uh, therapy. Uh, Previously, before flood, we give a magic trial, which is a ECF, a triplet regime, um, uh, and then followed by surgery and then another round of chemotherapy. So in this trial for magic uh, for magic uh, for magic trial uh, for GOG tumor uh, included about uh, eleven percent, yeah, because in this trial actually they include uh, more stomach cancer rather than uh, uh, gastroesophageal. Okay, this is how the trial was conducted. So they randomized equally to both arm, preoperative ECF versus surgery alone. Yeah, so this chemotherapy is actually quite um, toxic. Um, usually this is a chemo that I was given when, when I was, um, uh, you know, during the training last time. So it's uh, epiropacin, anthracycline-based chemotherapy, cisplatin and uh, fluorouracil. So this chemotherapy is highly hematogenic, so we need to support the patients uh, properly. And in, uh, you can see here clearly the median survival, overall survival is higher in preoperative chemotherapy compared to surgery alone. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of preoperative strategy? So advantages for the preoperative strategy is, uh, of course, firstly, we can increase the rate of curative r not resection. We can eradicate the micrometastasis disease because as we know that GOJ or gastric cancer is highly systemic disease. So we can eradicate the micrometastasis because we may miss it in the CT scan, we, we can't really appreciate it from the CT scan. And it also demonstrates in vivo chemosensitivity. So we can basically gauge whether this is a bad tumor or is a good tumor. If patient, if, if the tumor responded very well with the chemotherapy, then we know that this is a good tumor, then it has a chance, high chance of cure. And <clears throat> typically, it's a better tolerated than uh, post-operative uh, therapy because if you give chemotherapy after the surgery, sometimes patients uh, end up with a lot of complication and it will delay the systemic treatment. So it's a good idea if you can give it prior to surgery when patient is a bit more fit compared to giving um, all the chemotherapy after. But of course, it comes with uh, some disadvantages such as risk of disease progression during pre-op treatment. Sometimes we want to give it a try, but unfortunately, it, is, it didn't really respond to the chemotherapy and it further, uh, you know, uh, progress and it might make the, the, the surgery is uh, complicated. Uh, and of course, definitely surgery may be delayed if significant toxicity occurs. As you know, that chemotherapy comes with toxicity and increase the risk of preoperative uh, morbidity. So come to this, uh, what we call it standard of care now. Uh, it's a FLOT trial. So FLOT is basically a, a triplet regime as well. It consists of lorurecil, oxaliplatin, and uh, docetaxel. Okay, so the comparative arm are equal for both. So the comparative arm is ECF or ECX. X stands for zero dark or oral chemotherapy uh, versus FLOT. Okay, so in this trial, they include... Um, uh, GOJ type one, uh, GOJ type one to three, about fifty six percent, and uh, other than that is a stomach uh, cancer. Yeah. So basically, uh, flood, uh, flood for uh, try they they uh, you know compare flood for versus ECF for ECF or ECF we give three cycles. Yeah, and then followed by resection and another three cycle uh, ECF or ECX. But for FLOT, usually we give up to four cycle. Yeah, because the regime is a bit different. FLOT, we give every two weekly. ECF or ECX, we give every three weekly. So the duration is actually more or less the same. It's just that the, 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 the component of the chemotherapy is different. And as you can see here, epirozine will be 50 mg, cisplatin is 60 mg. And I can tell you this is quite toxic for most of our patients. 
uh, a lot of patient cannot cannot bear the toxicity so we need to tweak the 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 the, the chemotherapy dose uh, same thing with fluoride um uh, i would say that a lot of patient actually cannot um tolerate uh, upfront fluoride with full dose and most of the time we need to reduce the dose or tweak and maybe um, change the infusion time. So instead of one day fluorouracil infusion, we give over two days. This is just to you know make sure that the patient can uh, tolerate the chemotherapy better. So there is a lot of um, uh, how to say um, the changes and a lot, uh, a lot of strategy that we need to to use to make sure that the patient can go through the treatment. Because for GOJ tumor, a lot of patients they are not very fit, they are middle age or elderly and they have uh, multiple issues, not, uh, you know, nutrition issue and all that. Right, as you can, as you can see here, uh, uh, FLOT versus uh, ECF, ECF, they have a better overall survival, uh, overall survival uh, advantage, uh, hazard ratio 0 0.77. Median overall survival for FLOT is 50 uh, months, uh, compared to ECF is 30, 35 months. And serious adverse event and hospitalization is about similar. Uh, actually, the difference between fluid and uh, ECF or ECX is the toxicity. So ECF or ECX is more is more immetogenic. It's more it has more vomiting, nausea and vomiting toxicity, uh, and also more uh, hematological uh, toxicity compared to fluid. Fluid usually has slightly less uh, hematogenic uh, toxicity, but uh, patient usually um, has more diarrhea and uh, body ache. So, is it chemo RT or chemo? So, as just now, as I show you the cross trial, okay, it has benefit compared to surgery alone, but the effect is more pronounced in squamous cells. So, in GOJ adenocarcinoma, usually we are pushing more chemo rather than chemo radiation. But how about, um, uh, you know? Uh, between this flood and cross, whether th this is better or not. yeah. So we're not sure whether flood is better than cross for GOG tumor. So the, this is the one of the latest uh, trial, SOPAC trial, comparing flood, which is a standard of care, and cross trial, uh, which is uh, chemo radiations, and followed by surgery. yeah. So in this trial shows that the complete response is slightly better in flawed, um, uh, flawed uh, uh, arm and median survival also a bit more better in five year survival. It, it tells us that perhaps uh, for Adeno CA, GOG, the chemotherapy component is very important yeah, to, to, to give survival benefit. However, the rate of complication after surgery is similar and death uh, within uh, uh, 90 days is slightly more in cross rather than flawed. And what's the uh, role of immunotherapy? I know a lot of people will ask about immunotherapy because it sounds sexy and they think this is a magic drug. Um, yes, it does actually help, uh, but you must remember that um, uh, immunotherapy is very, very expensive. So this is a uh, checkmate uh, 577. Uh, I just give you the, 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 the summary. So this is uh, basically uh, nivolumab uh, after resected esophageal uh, GOG tumor. So they give nivolumab after, after cross. So as you can see here, nivolumab versus placebo has uh, survival benefit. And this is free survival benefit compared to placebo. So. Uh, in, in summary, we can say that FLOT is still considered, uh, considered a standard of care. However, in this case, we don't give FLOT, we give all FLOTs, meaning that we omit one drug instead of giving three drugs because we have to tweak according to patient's um, condition. This patient has multiple comorbidity, so we need to weigh between, between the, the benefit and the risk. So uh, with a, a double treatment, also patient has a good response. Okay, and as we know, generally the outcome of GOG tumor is dismal, and we need to consider many factors, as I mentioned just now. And there is no absolute uh, right treatment for everyone, so we need to monitor. We need to see the patient 
you know and it's not just the tumor factor not just the the treatment available we need to see other factors as well patients background patient social history so social support and the financial issue as well and chemotherapy immunotherapy may give a better survival uh, as just now i i i, I show you uh, nivolumab and chemotherapy work best for response rates yeah so if you ask me you know immunotherapy and chemotherapy if you want response you want uh, um, you know, if you, you aim for surgery, you aim for curity, you want a better and faster response, it's always chemotherapy. But if you want survival benefit, then you may add uh, immunotherapy. But of course, the treatment will be very, very prolonged. I think with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karia from Oncology Team for the uh, remarkable uh, presentation on the conversion therapy uh, in treating the uh, COG and also the gastric cancer. So we coming to the end of the, our conference. So I would like to invite our uh, consultant, uh, Prof. Nick Riza Kosai, to give the closing remarks on our radio conference, uh, our conference today. I would like to invite uh, Prof. Nick. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming to this uh, CPC this morning and I would like to thank our colleagues, uh, our pathology colleagues and uh, oncologist uh, who has presented a very uh, succinct and uh, very well summarized uh, um, you know, regiment for uh, gastric cancer. Um, <clears throat> I represent a quite small fraternity of uh, upper gastrointestinal surgeon in, in Malaysia Despite, uh, from my point of view, in terms of upper GI tumors, uh, like esophageal and gastric cancer, it's still, from my point of view, it's still underestimated. Uh, you know, we don't have a, a proper registry at the moment, but the uh, Malaysian Upper GI Society, uh, which represents our fraternity, is um, uh, doing our best uh, to create a, a national registry, so hopefully we can uh, collect all these uh, data prospectively. Uh, as you can see, uh, you know, uh, in comparison with other GI uh, tumors, uh, you know, our counterpart, which is the colorectal cancer, which is pretty much more well established and much more common. Uh, and as you can see, uh, they even operate um, for patients with metastatic liver cancer, uh, liver metastases, uh, because it shows a much better overall survival. Um, in the past, um, you know, if you have gastric cancer or esophageal cancer, but in this uh, particular CPC, we uh, uh, specifically pertain to more on gastric cancer. Um, the prognosis at the beginning already is pretty poor, especially if the, uh, um, you know, the type of the histology is the diffuse type as opposed to the intestinal type. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, with the current availability of uh, uh, newer chemotherapy, um, you know, the flot in comparison with the magic has shown a double, uh, ben you know, uh, benefit as comparison to the uh, magic outcome. Plus, we have the immunotherapy as well, the HER uh, positivity uh, and the uh, PDL one, which now we try to encourage patients to have all these tests done. Uh, I think um, if we can get grant from the government, that will be grateful, and in collaboration with our pathology colleagues, uh, radiology colleagues, and our <coughs> um, oncology colleague, uh, we should start all these research. Especially we are in uh, in a business of uh, academic side. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is pretty promising uh, because the majority of uh, Malaysian cancers they present with uh, stage three, not just stage three, three B and stage four. And from the start, the outcome is bleak to begin with. But as you can see from this example of uh, case, uh, from the start, it should be stage four, and it should, uh, you know, by right, it, uh, you know, it is considered a death warrant for the patient. But uh, nevertheless, 
Um, I think conversion therapy in a Malaysian setting or in a Southeast Asian setting where most patients presented late, and you cannot compare with Korea or Japan where they do population screening and a majority of cases nowadays are uh, early stage. Hence, uh, more and more uh, procedures are done uh, endoscopically uh, <clears throat> as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, operate, you know, by surgical intervention. So in Malaysia, it's slightly different uh, unless we do population screening, but it, it's not cost-benefit at the moment because uh, the incidence of gastric cancer in this country is probably around 7 to 8 uh, in 100,000. So it's considered moderate to low. It's not high. So it has to be more of a selective screening. So we have to find a form of a selective tool to encourage our primary physicians in the clinic kesihatan or the GP to you know, identify you know, red flag symptoms so that they can refer to us early so at least we can do endoscopy, which is probably the most accurate as opposed to, the, uh, to doing a barrier meal. In Japan, they even do a population screening at the age of 40. <clears throat> whether it uh, depends on what the patient opt for, either Barrett's uh, meal or um, a, a gastroscopy. But in Malaysia, because most of our tumors are either <clears throat> stage 3B or stage 4, uh, I think, I think um, in the case of stage 4, um, uh, especially in young patients, uh, and as proven in this case of the benefit of uh, conversion therapy, I think we should never give up. And uh, we should never write uh, stage four off. And this is why I think uh, the paradigm should change. Uh, but we need the help of, uh, you know, our esteemed um, uh, oncologist, uh, pathologist. Uh, and this is why it's important uh, to have a, uh, an MDT discussion. Uh, hopefully, we can set uh, a specific uh, guidelines as those who would uh, be uh, beneficial or create a criterion for those who should uh, go for uh, a conversion treatment because if you look at several studies uh, like regatta trial, uh, there is no benefit in terms of surgery in stage four tumors. But uh, you know, I have colleagues in IKN, uh, I have colleagues from Kuching um, um, and Johor Bahru who does conversion treatment and actually shown uh, the benefit of uh, survival even beyond two years. So I think I think despite um, you know having a stage four, if you can live longer. I think uh, with a much better quality of life by resecting the primary tumor and continuing uh, hopefully uh, with a junked um, you know, immunotherapy, I think that's the way forward. Um, so um, you know, we have to be very progressive uh, and not be left behind. And in fact, uh, as the National University of Malaysia, we are the ones who take the lead. So um, with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending this um, uh, mini conference. And I would like to thank our colleagues again uh, for contributing uh, to this conference. And hopefully, we can collaborate more. Uh, with that, uh, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And thank you very much for attending.